Dr. King once said, the means by which we live have outdistanced the ends for which we live. Our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We have guided missiles and misguided men. We have guided missiles and misguided men and women. <clears throat> Dr. King's quote reminds us that when we build ICTs, we often focus on the could we as opposed to the should we. And I think that uh, as we reflect on Dr. King's words, it's appropriate to also reflect on this quote from the White House in a 2014 report about big data. And the concerns expressed, as they say, that big data analytics have the potential to eclipse long-standing civil rights protections in how personal information is used in housing, credit, employment, health, education, and the marketplace. Indeed, data resistance and data justice are 21st century civil rights challenges. So the plan for today is uh, I'll begin by talking about big data discrimination briefly. What is it? How can we conceptualize it? What is notice and choice privacy policy? Right, it sounds, it's like sort of jargony, right? What is this and how is it relevant to what we're talking about? And I'll talk about addressing notice policy and addressing choice policy and specifically pointing out the flaws in these policies and to identify why this is an important first step towards data resistance and data justice in an effort to try and prevent big data discrimination. So if these systems are flawed, where do we go beyond simply pointing out the flaws? I'll speak briefly about some proposals that I'm currently researching, some ideas that I'm currently working with, and it'd be great to hear from you also uh, what you think about where we should go from here. As social scientists, we often shine a light on things that are hidden. Some people refer to this as revealing hegemony. Some describe this process as shining a light on things that we can't see, either because we've never thought about them or they just don't seem to affect us, at least in, our, in terms of you know, the way that we see the world. My research in this respect focuses on shining a light on eligibility determinations, because that's what this is all about, really. Eligibility determinations include assessments and rankings of individuals for the purpose of making decisions, choosing people, and not choosing other people. Who gets hired, who gets promoted, who gets fired, who's targeted, and who is ignored? Where do we invest, and where do we divest? How much do we charge for that product in this context? You know, Joseph Turo at UPenn is doing some fascinating work uh, looking at the grocery store, talking about a place where uh, there's a lot that we don't see going you know, on. And he's surprised that the grocery stores still use paper pricing whereas on the internet, pricing varies and can be targeted depending upon purchasing habits, that sort of thing. Anyhow, so why does this matter? Why does eligibility and studying eligibility matter? Sure, eligibility determinations affect our social and mobile media experiences. Sure, they affect our Netflix, but they do a lot more than that as well. Every person in this room is affected by eligibility determinations. You're in this room as a result of an eligibility determination. Someone picked you to get into this school and as a result didn't pick someone else. How were you ranked? What was the system that was used to rank you to get you in here? Is that system standardized or is it changing? Are big data products being used to make that eligibility determination? But it's more than just getting into university. It's about who gets a loan at the bank, at what rate, and who doesn't. It's about who gets insurance, at what rate, and who doesn't. Increasingly, it's who gets stopped by the police, and who gets stopped by the police again, and who gets to cross the border. 
eligibility determinations uh, play a role in our lives in ways that we cannot see and do not understand. And the concern is that big data products and services are increasingly playing a role in eligibility. And this is why we have to make sure that big data products do not lead to discrimination. So how does big data discrimination happen? We could speak for hours about this because there are lots of different theories and lots of different ways to look at this. I'm going to focus on three ideas that can help briefly introduce us to this. The first, many of you have heard this term privacy by design. It's kind of like a catchphrase, right? When we build uh, new technologies, new ICTs, we are sensitive to privacy concerns, so we design them to have sort of like privacy components built into them. I call this, first uh, look into this, discrimination by design. Frank Pasquale, in his new book, The Black Box Society, talks about this. And he talks about this notion that algorithms and other tools used to create eligibility determination systems um, could be biased in the way that they are shaped, in the way they are structured, in the way they evolve. So that's one way to think about this. Are the algorithms biased? Do they discriminate? One anecdotal example that helps us to understand this better is a study by Harvard researcher Latanya Sweeney. The published work is called Discrimination in Online Ad Delivery. So here's a brief overview of the study. So her name's Latanya. She thought she would do something that many of us have done, you know, type something into Google and sort of see what pops up. Um, so what she did is she chose a number of names that are, in her opinion, associated with African Americans. And then she had an, uh, another set of names that were supposed to be more neutral in terms of who they typically are associated with. So she began with her name, Latanya. And this was one of the ads that popped up. Latanya, arrested? That's strange. All right, obviously somebody's making a connection in the software between the name Latanya and the criminal justice system. She also noticed that there was sort of like a data brokery uh, link associated with it, so she followed it and found it connected to this background check service called Checkmate. But it's weird. They had a profile for Latanya Farrell, but no criminal history. But the ad said Latanya Farrell arrested and linked to the, the site. So what's Google doing here? It's confusing. So she looked further. So the first name was Latanya, and then she looked at Tanya. Look at the ad that popped up for Tanya. Also kind of a data broker, but no criminal justice reference. No Tanya arrested. Then she typed in another name that was that's arguably more neutral. Jill. Jill Foley. So these are the ads that came up for Jill Foley when the name was typed into Google. First, again, this data, data brokers are you know, kind of a big deal. We're not going to talk about them right now, but OK. But an ad for Macy's and an ad for a Dr. Jill Foley. No Jill Foley arrested. Now, she, when she went to the same background check site and found a Jill Foley, she found a Jill Foley with a criminal record. But the Google ad did not say Jill Foley arrested. So here, and this of course has been debated from a variety of perspectives, we have this question, who is creating this linkage in terms of how the algorithms produce ads? between names and results. Another interesting thing that uh, Sweeney looked at was images associated with names. So these are the, the images that popped up when Latanya was typed into images. And these were the images that popped up when the name Jill was typed into images. Notice a difference? So who decides? What name is associated with what type of image? Who decides who gets this connection to the criminal justice system you know, in an ad uh, referring to it when the name is typed in? 
two other types of, uh, two other ways to look at big data discrimination, how it happens. No, number two is new discrimination builds upon the old. When we talk about big data, we often think of, wow, this is like such a new thing, right? Um, and maybe the data collection systems are like starting from scratch. Uh, the, the, data, the databases themselves like are brand new, right? So they can't be biased, not the case. In many cases, the databases that are being integrated into these products have been around for quite some time. And it's not a stretch to say that there is bias built into these systems. Much has been written about this the credit reporting system, the criminal justice system, the healthcare system, to suggest that there's bias and discrimination built into these data collection systems is not really that wild a thing to say. So both the databases themselves and the methods for collecting data that have developed over time arguably are discriminatory, and big data products use those systems. So that, again, leads to built-in discrimination, potentially. And whether or not the systems are discriminatory, and there are hints that they are, people still want to discriminate. I don't think this comes as a surprise to anyone in this class. Unfortunately, people still want to discriminate. And there's really interesting work coming out of Carnegie Mellon, Alessandro Acquisti, who's looking at hiring discrimination and the use of digital media products to enable that. Specifically, the ability to circumvent the law to find out things about people that you can't ask legally in an interview. So you can't ask someone's religion in an interview. You can't ask someone's sexual orientation. And Akisti's been able to find examples where employers are discriminating based on that information. But how do they find it out if they can't, if it's not on an application and it's not asked in an interview? So Akisti ran a study, I'll describe it briefly, where he set up social media profiles for people with the exact same name, one was a male uh, that was identified as Muslim, another was a male identified as Christian, same name, different images, and submitted basically um, identical, identical application information, but different links to like LinkedIn accounts, for example. And they found in this study that in certain parts of the country, statistically significant data suggests that there is bias in terms of hiring practices. And they associate this bias with social media profiles. So if these are issues that you're interested in, I heard over breakfast that you had Dana Boyd here not too long ago. So Dana is very involved with this Data and Society <coughs> Initiative at NYU. And every year, they run uh, a data, data and civil rights conference. So I encourage you, if you like what you hear today, to send me an email, of course. I'm very friendly. You know, we can chat. Uh, but also check out this conference. They've had just their second one. It's called A New Era of Policing and Justice. And they look at things like body-worn cameras and the type of data that's being produced there, social media tracking, predictive policing, predictive algorithms. Right? I think over breakfast, they were saying that this is stuff that Dana is really interested in. So check that out. All right, so let's get to notice and choice privacy policy. What is it and why does it matter to what we're talking about? So how do we prevent big data discrimination? There are different strategies for doing so. Laura Donardis has argued that at the moment, the strongest form of uh, privacy protection that we have is what's called de facto privacy protections meaning internet governance by platforms. Platforms determine how your data is to be shared and protected, and that becomes basically the privacy protection because it, you know, internet governance by platforms. Sounds kind of weak to me. It does to Laura as well. Another uh, area where there's a lot of interesting work happening is what we call data resistance ICTs. This is kind of like a ground up, some would say neoliberal approach individuals developing encryption software and reputation management services and counter surveillance technologies. <coughs> There's a growing uh, movement of, uh, of uh, data resistance uh, services and technologies that people can engage in. And then there's the top-down approach, 
the, prominent, the most prominent top-down approach in this country and also around the world. It's called notice and choice privacy policy. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. It's a top-down approach. It's how the federal government approaches these things. So why talk about this? Why talk about notice and choice privacy policy? Why talk about privacy policies? Why talk about you know, being given access to data? Why that matters? Mainly because notice and choice privacy policy is the central policy instrument that the federal government in this country employs in an attempt to protect data privacy. To this day, proposals for new bills having to do with protecting privacy in the 21st century employ language that follows this model. My argument is that notice and choice privacy policy is deeply flawed and that it offers only a first step to protection but fails to achieve results. And for that reason, it's a terrible place to finish the conversation. A great place to start, but a terrible place to finish. And unfortunately, the federal government here and governments around the world seem to think that we can just have notice and choice privacy policy and, that's, and we're done. Problem solved. Obviously, that's not the case, as I intend to argue. So a, a very quick history in the interest of time. So where does notice and choice privacy policy come from and what does it look like? Began in this country, 1973, the Federal Trade Commission, Consumer Protection Bureau, right, develops five fair information practice principles. Notice, choice, access, integrity, and enforcement. It would become to be known as notice and choice. In the 80s, the OECD, an international body, uh, develops guidelines for different countries around the world to develop privacy law using the FTC's model. In the years that follow, we get privacy laws throughout the world, including in Canada and in the EU and in other places, that uses language that comes directly from the 1973 document. In the US, we have this as well, but we don't have as clear a top-down uh, approach as there is in other countries. It gets into place mainly by self-regulation, industry policing itself, a patchwork of privacy laws like COPPA, which is a, a, a privacy law directed at protecting children, as well as FTC enforcement efforts, specifically the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the Federal Trade Commission Act. All right, so let's break down this jargon a little bit. So what is notice and choice? It's two things. Notice, telling people what's happening with their data, i.e., privacy policies and terms of service agreements. I'm sure you're already now starting to think about why this is a problem. And choice is access to and control of personal data at all phases of collection and use. So now I'm going to talk about why both notice and choice policy are flawed. And again, I do this because we need to call attention to this to show the federal government and industry that this is a great place to start, a terrible place to finish. So what's the biggest lie on the internet? Anybody want to guess? If you were at breakfast, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> what's the biggest lie on the internet? There are no girls on the internet. No one that actually is a really big lie. That, that's true. But, <laughs> but what is referred to anecdotally as the biggest lie on the internet? I agree to these terms and conditions. <laughs> is considered anecdotally the biggest lie on the internet. I agree to these terms and conditions. The fact that many of you are nodding your head convinces me that without showing you any empirical evidence that you know that notice policy is a problem. Do you read terms and conditions before you agree to them? Have you ever? So here's what the data shows us. And these are just two studies. There are lots of them. So here's uh, sort of a seminal work from McDonald and Craner, Carnegie Mellon, which says, you know, something that we all feel. Privacy policies are too long, boring. So what they did was they, ha they looked at sort of like uh, low, medium, and high uh, consumption users to get a sense of how many policies they'd have to read to provide informed consent. And in a nutshell, what they found is that on average, to ensure informed consent, you 
every one of you would have to spend 40 minutes a day, every day, reading privacy policies to ensure informed consent. Now that doesn't sound very possible, does it? So now I'd like to talk about a study that I'm currently working on with, uh, uh, with Anne Oldorf Hirsch from UConn. While lots of scholar, a number of studies have come out that talk about the problems with privacy policies, nobody's actually demonstrated empirically this biggest lie on the internet idea. So that's what we set out to do. So the first thing we did was we did something that I encourage you all to try and do. It's a really fun and difficult exercise to come up with a new social networking site. <laughs> so we created a fake one. And we told participants that they were going to be signing up to this new site to do some testing of the site to tell us what they thought of it. So the site we came up with, a uh, competitor of LinkedIn, called Name Drop. Drop that name, get that job. Right? It's a terrible idea, especially in, a, in a, a lecture about civil rights and access and stuff. It's a terrible idea for a site, but whatever. It served the purpose for you know, evaluating. Now notice a couple things about here, because we'll talk about this in a minute. We call this the quick join option. This looks familiar. Most sites are using this these days. right? Sign up now for free. Put in your name and some info. Here's the terms of service. By clicking join, you agree, right? Very small letters and with a link, right? How many people click on that link? So here's some of the method. Uh, the average adult reading speed that we refer to is 200, between 200 and 300 words per minute. The privacy policy, which basically is just as long as LinkedIn's, about 8,000 words. So it should take between 27 and 40 minutes to read. Terms of service. Again, similar to LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn 4,300 words between 15 and 22 minutes. So who read the privacy policies? More than 500 people in the study. About 73% did not even look at it. They just did the quick join option. Now this is, these are communication study students who study privacy in class, right? <laughs> think about how this would relate to the general public, OK? 27% did read it, but look at the results for how long they spent on it. Some spent as little as three seconds, which is basically just scrolling. The average reading time was 12.5 seconds. Oh, and by the way, everyone accepted it, whether they read it or not. The terms of service, the results were similar. 14 second average reading time with a range from 3.5 to 17 minutes, but I can tell you that the 17 minutes, they're outliers. Now, we're working a lot with anecdotes in this realm, so we thought, hey, let's have a little fun. There's this anecdote that the privacy community tends to use, like, oh, people will give away their firstborn child with a privacy policy, but no one actually had ever really tested it. So what we did is we put in what we call a landmine into the terms of service policy, a child assignment clause, to see if anyone would catch it. So apparently 98% of the people that we surveyed are willing to give us their firstborn to test a, a new site. So again, this demonstrates it's you know, a bit of a problem. But the problem goes beyond behavior. It also, as I've said, gets to the heart of the approach of the federal government. So here we have plans for a, a new law, which sounds good. And a lot of this is, sounds good the strategies, right? But the deliverables are questionable. So the Data Privacy Bill of Rights, that sounds good, right? That sounds like civil liberties protection. So we have this clause, transparency, which comes again directly from that 1973 document. Consumers have a right to easily understandable and accessible information about privacy and security practices. No explanation about how that access translates into informed consent, but make sure that access is there. So my conclusion in this section is, as I've said, notice offers a first step towards protection, but fails to produce results. So clearly something more is needed. We'll get to that at the end. Now about choice. This is a bit more complicated because the choice component itself is quite complicated. So this is what choice, in terms of the proposals by the federal government, looks like. This is what the federal government is expecting all of you to do to ensure that choice policy works. Now, 
Think about whether this is possible. We'll break this down a bit. So choice refers to user access to data and control of data. So every company that collects data should give you access to it. And as we know, of course, a McKinsey report from five years ago says every, and, uh, rather, excuse me, every sector of the global economy is now addressing big data questions. But of course, how they address those questions is not sort of a standardized approach. This means that within and across the global economy, there is a mosaic of big data approaches. The types of data that's being collected and used, how it's being used, how it's being shared, there isn't like one standard approach. There is a, mo I like to use this term mosaic, a mosaic of approaches. Okay, so that sounds easy. I guess we should get access to all those approaches. Including data brokers. What's a data broker? Well, it's a company that collects and shares and manages data and sells data sets to companies and rankings to companies. These companies are not in the business of interacting with you, but the federal government says that they should. So not only are you supposed to interact with the interfaces of these companies across the world, you're supposed to engage with data brokers too. Each of these companies must create a, a system. This is straight from the FTC's recommendations, which again, straight into the White House proposal. Each system has to create a system for you to engage with and review. And you're supposed to be given the ability to make modifications. I'm sure the majority of people in this class are interested in data science, but ask yourself whether this is something that the general public will be able to handle. The ability to make modifications to data sets uh, at all of these organizations. And that's, that's not all. Right? This is a quickly evolving industry. So as the industry evolves, all of these companies that are also trying to turn a profit are supposed to engage in public education campaigns to continually update the general public on the latest and greatest. So this paper in Big Data and Society, so here's my critique. This paper in Big Data and Society that uh, I published, I argue, uh, similar to like how I'm arguing today, that this is a big, huge problem. And the, the main po focus of the article is basically to point out the problem. My research that I'm working on now is trying to get at where do we go from here. So I, I refer to an argument uh, developed 100 years ago by Walter Lippmann in this book, The Phantom Public. He calls it the fallacy of democracy. Now, when I say fallacy of democracy, right, start to think about how this idea makes you feel, especially in a talk about you know, civil rights and civil liberties. Start to think about how a focus simply just on language and discourse that sounds good, but ignores pragmatics, how to get to things like the achievement of justice, is an important step, looking at the language and moving beyond it. So Lippmann talks about this fallacy of democracy. He says, Self-governance for millions is impossible. Think about all the things that government does. They fix potholes, they run a military, they run healthcare, they run the education system. How big an ecclesia would we need, right? I mean, the Greek system was also discriminatory, but we hold it up as this model, right? How big an ecclesia would we need to get everyone inside and talking about all of these things? Ignore the technocratic divide that exists. Littman says, we lack what he calls omnicompetence, the ability to know how to build missiles and to design uh, cancer, you know, cancer treatment technologies and how to fill potholes. We aren't experts in everything. We can't expect to be. We also lack time. And we lack a system. I say in the paper, had we the faculties and the system for enabling millions of citizens to realize popular rule, to govern all areas of government, none of us would have time for work, family, or enjoyment. In this fantasy society, a true democracy supposedly, society would remain at a standstill because we'd be in that ecclesia all day. So what I do is I use this argument and apply it to the big data context, and I call it the fallacy of data privacy self-management. Had we the faculties and the system for enabling every digital citizen the ability to understand and continually manage the evolving data-driven internet, 
to control data being collected, organized, analyzed, repurposed, and sold by every application, commercial organization, non-commercial organization, <gasps> government agency, data broker, and third party to understand every terms of service agreement and privacy policy. Would we have time to actually use the internet to work, to have a life? The fallacy of personal data sovereignty in a digital universe, or rather, this is the fallacy of uh, data privacy self-management in a, a universe defined by big data. There's just too much to do. Choice, is, choice policy is an impossibility. So a little bit more information about this and just some sort of, uh, like sort of a sprinkling of some things to think about when you're evaluating the extent to which choice is problematic. So if you look at IBM's site where they talk about big data and how do we sort of conceptualize big data, they talk about at least three Vs. Volume, right, how big is big data? Velocity, real-time streaming analytics, right? Find out what your consumers think right now. Find out, like, how patients are doing right now. And variety. So the reason I bring this up is because I want us to start thinking about, like, how difficult choice will be. So the term sort of at the edge of where the bigness is right now is the Yottabyte, or Yodabyte. So the NSA is completing the development of a spy center in Utah capable of housing Yottabytes of data. So that's sort of the edge of what we're talking about. To put that into context, a, a few years ago it was estimated that the entire global internet and every piece of data on it was 500 exabytes. So this is where we're going. So certainly it's big. And the bigness has an impact on you. This is Max Schrems, famous for being the first person, apparently, to request his data from Facebook. Two years of use, they sent him 1,200 printed pages. And they're keeping everything, even stuff that he deleted from his profile. You remember, uh, for those of you who have been using Facebook for a while, remember pokes? They keep yeah. all the pokes. <laughs> and when he asked, he asked them, why do you keep the pokes? Like, it seems like something that, you know. Well, there are lawsuits about poking people, like uh, um, harassment from pokes <laughs> that are outstanding. So any, in, any situation where, like, there could potentially be a lawsuit, we keep that data. This is called retention policy, an area that the privacy advocacy community is looking into. Right? This is one site. How many sites do you visit a day? How many sites have your data? And then we're just talking about sites. Actually, let me back up for a second. <clears throat> I like to do this exercise in my class because I, I feel that it helps us to reveal uh, not only the variety of sources for data, but how we are uh, so involved in that data collection, right? Because when we think of data, we tend to think Facebook, Google, Twitter, all this stuff. So what I'd like you all to do now, if you don't mind, I'd like you to go into your wallets. I'm not asking for money. Don't worry. And I'd like you to pull out your loyalty cards, or at least one of your loyalty cards. And I'd like you to hold it up. And I'd like you to hold up your phone also. Okay. Sometimes these physical activities are imprinted on your brain. And once you start pulling out your loyalty card, shout out where it's for. Kroger. Kroger, Kroger of course. Right Aid. Rite Aid. OK, yeah, Maris. Kroger. Yeah, what's that one there? OK, multiple companies, right. Where else? Panera. OK, wait, you're not holding them up. Hold them up. Please, hold them up. Hold them up. OK? Nobody is forcing you to carry these around. You carry them in your pockets. I can tell you that Kroger doesn't want to give you, doesn't give you that card for a dollar off milk. Sure, that gets you coming back to the store. But data is currency, right? We were talking at breakfast about how insurance companies someday might be interested in how much cheddar cheese you eat <laughs> and how much pizza you eat. The pizza index, right, for ranking people for being risk at risk. So sharing data between grocery stores and insurance companies. All right, so here's another problem associated with big data. By the way, how are we doing on time? Am I going five more minutes or, yeah? Yeah, okay. Here's another problem with data, another story. Noam Gulai, a photographer, shares an image on Flickr a number of years ago. That image has been misappropriated, stolen, and reused 
hundreds of times, probably more than a thousand times, all over the internet in countries throughout the world. All of these challenges having to do with choice, right? We think about maybe we'll have to deal with American companies, but you won't only have to deal with American companies. There are companies and entities all over the world that could be using your data. And one other thing to think about, I want to show you a short clip, uh, just to sort of show you a little bit of research that I'm also doing uh, with some folks at the University of Toronto. Another aspect of this conversation of the bigness that we often don't think about. So here's a, here's a short three minute video. Xmaps is an internet mapping tool that allows you to see the routes your data packets take through the internet. We are a team of researchers, programmers, and media artists from the U of T Faculty of Information and OCAD University. Our goal is to show people where their data actually goes when they use the internet, so as to understand better who handles it and why this matters. We've been doing that by developing a trace route generation program so that people can anonymously contribute their own routes to our database. We've also been reaching out to the general public by presenting our findings in lectures and informational events at the Ontario Science Centre and by developing our Explore page, where users can check out geographical representations of the data we've collected. Well, I hope we're dispelling some of the myths that get in the way of that uh, effective understanding. Uh, in particular, the idea that the internet is a cloud, um, as a, an ethereal space that doesn't have any borders. In fact, um, it, the internet consists centrally of a few very uh, important points, internet exchange points, um, and other switching centers. These are in big buildings at the center of cities, and who owns those, and uh, the deals that are made there are basically what drives internet routing. Did you know that a lot of internet traffic that begins in Canada and ends in Canada travels via the U.S.? We call this boomerang routing. For instance, if I send an email to, to Nancy and she's at OCAD, which you can see right there, it basically goes down the street to the McClellan Physics Lab, and then the packets go from there to, to OCAD pretty directly. If I send an email to Ontario Student Assistance Program, which is just over there, it goes you know, from here to New York, Chicago, and then back here. And I think that that sort of contrast is really a striking one and, and helps drive home the point about the physical aspects, but also the peculiarities of routing. Uh, we tend to assume that the internet is structured as a very efficient way of routing packets, but how the internet is actually put together is through a series of private arrangements, largely, between carriers and for various reasons, they're very selective about who they exchange their traffic with. And that's why there's such a difference between the two routes be from here to OCAD and to OSAP. It's because of the carriers that are involved. It's not about efficiency of routing. So I can tell you that in Canada, this is something that we're quite concerned about. Because I can tell you that when data crosses the border, just like when I crossed the border yesterday, it's the Patriot Act and FISA allow for search. And we have no constitutional protection over our data in your country. So I can tell you that this is something that a number of countries throughout the world are very concerned about. And this adds, and uh, you know, boomerang routing is something that Americans should be concerned about as well. But this adds to the list of tasks uh, of things that we have to deal with. NSA surveillance of Canadian data. And by the way, you may not have noticed, both of those transmissions were what we call domestic internet transmissions. So Canadians accessing Canadian servers. In our database, we have all of the Canadian banks, the major ones, government institutions, cultural institutions, all domestic internet traffic boomeranging. All of these problems and this is what we get from the federal government. Access and accuracy. Consumers have a right to access and correct personal data in usable fa formats. But how do we do that? No direction. Just access. So again, choice offers a first step towards pro protection but fails to produce results. So we need something more. So this is where I'm going to end, and perhaps we can chat about this. This is where my research is going. 
As Lippmann says in his book, perhaps the imperfect solution to the fallacy of democracy is representative governance, representation. Perhaps the imperfect solution to the fallacy of data privacy self-management is representative management, representative governance. And that's what we're seeing. So LifeLock and RepinUp are two examples of infomediaries, in-betweens, providing services that people can pay for to help them manage their data. Some have suggested that this neoliberal approach needs to have sort of like a, both a nonprofit component to it to ensure equity as opposed to equality, right? Targeting of communities with services that may be more likely to be subject to big data discrimination. And how do we do that? Some have suggested that we need top-down approaches. So in Canada, we have what's called the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, a federal agency committed specifically to privacy protections. And folks like Peter Swire at Ohio State have been arguing for years that in the United States, the FTC is not enough. We need a privacy bureau as well. So this is perhaps where we go from here, at least, in terms of the conversation about notice and choice. Perhaps we need assistance, representative management. 